Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, Joe Biden has a surprisingly good time at his State of the Union address by shooting down Republican hecklers like they were a Chinese balloon. Then Democratic strategist Michael Podhorzer stops by to discuss what the midterm results can teach us about 2024. And later, House Republicans take on the people's business in their first big oversight hearing that asks the question, what did Twitter know about Hunter Biden's laptop and when did they know it? All right, let's get to the news. President Biden is barnstorming the country this week after delivering a malarkey-free State of the Union on Tuesday night that lasted 72 minutes and framed his expected re-election bid as a contest between a bipartisan leader who fights for working people and an unserious party that's been captured by out-of-touch extremists, an argument that some Republicans helped him make by heckling the president for telling the truth about what they've proposed. We'll get to that later. Biden focused most of the speech on the economy, both the progress we've made under his presidency and the work left to be done, which he repeatedly punctuated with a phrase that seems tailor-made for a campaign slogan. We've been sent here to finish the job. Let's finish the job this time. Let's finish the job. We gotta finish the job. Let's finish the job, Dan. Come on, where's the the t-shirts? Let's get some, uh, where's the merch? Um, What was your first reaction after listening to this speech? I will say going into this speech, I dreaded it. (laughs) <laughs> not because not because of Joe Biden. I mean, you and I have been through a lot of State of the Unions together. Mm. It's safe to say we hate them. Mm-hmm. Whether Barack Obama's giving them, George W. Bush, Bill, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Joe Biden. It's just this, the speeches are always kind of the same. We know what the notes are. We know. It's an anachronistic format. Yeah, it's just, it's restrictive. Some people, half the room applauses, half doesn't. Kevin McCarthy looks like he ate some bad beans or something while he sits there. It's None of it's great. And I was like, what a way. And I even remember when the Crooked staff was like, you guys want to do a group thread? And I was like, no, but I guess I will. <laughs> like, But I have to say it was great. I enjoyed it. The Biden did a good job. The speech was, I think, a very politically smart speech. He delivered the shit out of it. The heckling was interesting. It was it was great. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Exceeded expectations. Good way to spend a Tuesday night. I mean, I wouldn't say that I enjoyed it. <laughs> I did. I, I mean, I thought. I, <laughs> here's what I think. I think every State of the Union uh, is always one of the most challenging speeches you'll ever have to write, uh, and for presidents, one of the challenge, most challenging speeches they'll have to give. A 72 minute State of the Union that's not a laundry list, but actually has a theme and a message that breaks through to people is a monumental achievement. And that's what I think the speech was. Um, Because it's really difficult to break through in a State of the Union, and I do think that they succeeded at doing that. Um, My first reaction was that if Joe Biden loses re-election, it will not be because of his message. In this speech, he has the message for his re-election. What a bold take that is. I mean, I didn't If I Joe Biden lose. loses, it won't be from his speech in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got a message. Like, he has a very clear, politically astute message that he laid out in the speech. Um, you know, it's the it's he's it's Scranton Joe. Scranton Joe is back. He's uh he's he's fighting for uh he's fighting to rebuild the American the American middle class, and he's uh willing to work with people on that. Um, and he has in the past, and uh, he's also willing to take on people who are standing in the way. And that's it. That's his message. I got a couple of questions for you as a writer of many, a State of the Union. Mm-hmm. One, what do you think of finished the job? I think all slogans are stupid. Um, <laughs> so therefore, I have you lower your expectations on them. And I think you can overthink these things. You have a bunch of consultants in a room. They're doing the polling. You need to get middle class in there, right? All this bullshit. I think it's it, you, you can't overthink it. Sometimes it, it makes sense, right? He, uh, every president running for election wants some version of "finish the job" <laughs> as their slogan, and you know it's very it's very Biden, right? It's very sort of down to earth. I'm good with it. We had what what, what was ours? I was looking it up because I, I forgot what the Obama 2012 one was for a second. Forward. Yeah, I was on that campaign. <laughs> so yeah. Clearly, yeah. was not as memorable as our 08 uh, yes. slogan. Right. So it's like, was forward some, uh, you know, stroke of genius? No, I don't think so. It was fine. It worked. Um, But I think finish the job is great. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Not because the words finish the job. 
are somehow going to change the election. You're exactly right. Slogans are stupid. Slogans say the unions are particularly stupid. Yeah. I mean, you remember that in this exact, this speech at this exact junction, our presidency, we debuted the monstrosity that was winning the future. A slogan that made it through an entire policy process, multiple focus groups, and no one ever realized it abbreviated to WTF. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what slogan, here's what slogans are for. Now that I live out in Los Angeles, every time you'd come here for a fundraiser with a politician, you get in a room with a bunch of Hollywood producers and writers, and uh, inevitably the first question would be like, why can't Democrats have more of a slogan? We have a bunch of writers and producers out here who could help you develop a, a slogan that actually sticks, that's on a bumper sticker, just like the Republicans, because the Republicans are always good at slogans. You always fucking hear that in Los Angeles. And that's that's what I think of when I think about people asking for slogans in 2023. <laughs> Here's what I think is interesting about it, though, is uh, for putting aside the words, it is an acknowledgement, I think, from Biden that he is in a unique situation. In most cases, presidents are were in this exact point in their presidency are looking for a way, an argument for why they should be reelected. Biden is coming up with an argument for why he is the, should run for reelection because mm -hmm. of his age, the fact that a lot of people you know viewed him as a bridge, you know, potentially a one-term bridge, and so now he is, as far as we know, decided to run. And the polling shows that even among people who did vote for him and probably will vote for him, there is some skepticism about that. So fit, why me? To finish the job I was doing. There was more work for me to do. And I think that's interesting. Yeah, he promised to be a bridge to the next generation, and uh, that bridge isn't finished. <laughs> yes, finished. Look, some bridges are longer than others. He crossed the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. I think it goes on for fucking forever. Uh, yeah, I'm still going to be the bridge. I just It's not done yet. Um, I also think he was having fun. He was energetic. He was lively. He enjoyed interacting with the people in that chamber, which is saying a lot. Um, he enjoyed it even when they were booing him. Uh, he was bigger than his detractors, right? Which is important. And I think, you know, altogether, he was just, he was a happy warrior and he's always best when he's a happy warrior. He's sort of, his kind of approach was, oh, you think I might be a little old or maybe not be up to the job? I'll see you asshole stand up here and deliver a speech like this for 72 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I may be old, but these people are fucking crazy. That's... <laughs> That's the that's the real election. Put that on right a bumper. Oh look, another Hollywood <laughs> producer came up with a slogan. <laughs> um, so the White House has surely been looking at some of the same polling we all have. Uh, most voters are unhappy with the direction of the country, the economy, and the job that Biden has done as president. Knowing that, what do you think they set out to achieve with this speech? Remind people of what he did what it and what it means and how it's impacted the economy, which is, I think you could say that about 90% of state of the unions ever delivered. President Biden, because of the type of presidency that he has decided to have to be a little less in the news necessarily, or the center of the conversation as sort of a response to Trump and perhaps, and because of the media environment he's in, those things are less well-known. The things he did are less well-known in part because they weren't controversial. Everyone knew Obama passed health care because- Half the country, sometimes more than half the country, hated it. People, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, this is, I know this is shocking, but the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill did not spark an outcry. <laughs> like People didn't have a strong reaction to that. And so he has a lot of non-controversial achievements. And one of the only ways, and since the press covers controversy, the only way you can get that known to people is to stand up there and tell them. Yes. I also think he could have done that in a way that, I was worried about, which was just listing off a series of accomplishments. Yeah. And I think they did a really good job putting the accomplishments in a context that lets people know, I have been fighting for you. We're not done yet. And I will continue to fight for you. And he also wanted to remind people not just of what he achieved, but that he cares about them, that he's a president who gives a shit about people um, and always has been. And I think that sort of placing himself as on the side of most people in this country versus the powerful interests that are standing in their way, whether they be corporations or crazy Republicans, I think was was part of the goal of the speech. And I think they achieved that um, really well. Um, you wrote a message box about the speech that focused on uh, Biden's economic agenda, which he called a blue collar blueprint to rebuild America. Uh, what do you think they were trying to do with that branding? Now, it's just a big branding conversation here on the <laughs> America today. <laughs> You're in Hollywood. I live kind of near Silicon Valley. We're basically doing yeah. it. We become yeah. what we hate. <laughs> <laughs> 
How can Biden get the State of the Union on a bumper sticker? <laughs> can you do it in 280 characters, Mr. President? Doesn't have to now. Not how is this a tic- How do you make this a TikTok? Not if he's a subscriber to Twitter Blue. He can write all the fucking words he wants. He really. Sh- they should just put the State of the Union full thing on Twitter just now yeah. to see if it breaks. Perfect. It. Great. Um, I, the reason I wrote the I wrote a message box post about this is I found it to be very interesting that. You and I have talked many times in this podcast about how the existential threat to Democrats, despite all of our recent success, is continued erosion with working class voters, with voters who did not go to college. U.S. politics has become more polarized on educational lines. Democrats, a much larger share of our electorate has become college educated. A much larger share of the Republican electorate did not go to college. And we can survive in that world when our erosion among voters that didn't go to college was limited only to white voters because we were, the country's getting more diverse. Barely. Barely. We, but we could we barely could survive. survive. Yeah. We could barely survive. You need, what you really need in an ideal world is less erosion with white non-college voters and sky high turnout. You, what you want is what Obama's coalition 2012 looked like. Yeah. Well, and I will say, just to remind people again, about a third of the Democratic coalition, the voters who come to vote for Democrats in the presidential elections and other elections, is non-college educated white people. Still, even with all that erosion, that's still about a third, one in every three voters. Now, when you remember that we won the election by 40,000 votes over a handful of states, you don't want to lose a lot of them, right? Right, exactly, yeah. And in 2020, for the first time, we saw erosion among voters of color that did not go to college, particularly men. And if that trend were to continue, we are doomed. There is no math where we win. That is, it is game over. And Biden, he's been doing this for a while in his presidency, but this is the most high profile way is to, this is the most high profile way is to try to center his economic agenda as a specific remedy for the challenges that people without a college education may have in our economy, to rebut the idea that Republicans have very successfully pushed that despite the fact that our economic policies are good for the working class and good for the middle class and much better than Republican policies, that we are somehow a party of elites who look down their nose at people who didn't go to college. And so I think he's very clearly to making an attempt to tackle the biggest political problem and the biggest threat we have for 2024. And that, you know, you can quibble about whether you like blue blueprint, a blue collar blueprint or whatever. But um, I think the, the strategy underneath it is very, very interesting and absolutely essential. I also think that he executed that strategy in the speech in an interesting way. It wasn't just about him reciting policies that would help um, blue collar workers. Like he he when he got to we talked about the infrastructure bill, which, you know, uh, us very online libs tend to roll our eyes over. Right. Not very exciting. You you just did earlier about the infrastructure <laughs> bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. I roll my eyes at bipartisanship. I fucking love a road. Oh, okay? Yeah. You, OK, good, good, good. <laughs> And same thing when people talk about the heartland or politicians talk about blue collar America. There's a tendency for, you know, us us online libs to roll our eyes. But he during that section of the speech, he tells the story about finally fixing the Brent Spence bridge that's between Ohio and Kentucky, two states that he did not win. Um, And the person he points out to illustrate the story is this young black woman who's a member of the local iron workers. And and he talks about how she's really proud to rebuild this bridge. And I think it's part of the strategy is Biden showing that he cares about people, whoever they are, wherever they are, whoever they vote for. Like, it doesn't matter. Right. It's not one demographic that he's trying to win over or one place in the country or he's just trying to help Democrats or just grow the Democratic coalition. Like what he's trying to do is be a president for all Americans wherever you are. And I think he's also trying to say that this this group of people in the country who don't have a college degree and are in the heartland and have been watching jobs move away and have seen their communities hollowed out. It's not just the white working class people that uh, this, that we, you know, the New York Times talks to in the Pennsylvania diner that have become the stereotype. It's, it's uh, folks of color. It's people who are in suburbs. It's people who are in exurbs. It's people all over the place. It's most of the country. It's most of the country. Um, and I think that was, I think he did that really well in the speech. There's two versions of this appeal. There's one that does not work, which is when we just try to grab voters by the lapel and say, don't you know that our policies help you? You're voting against your economic interests. 
idiots. You make minimum wage. We're going to double the minimum wage. Do you hate money, person? Like yeah. it's, that, is, that's the, that is a very typical way of doing it. And then there's this other sense that they're, the only way to live a good life in America is to have gone to college and had a white-collar job. And Biden is doing something very different here. He is using his policies as a proxy to say it doesn't have to be college or failure, right? There are lots of different career paths in America, and I'm going to support those as well. And I think it's he, he is very constitutionally designed, set up to do that. That is, that's the Scranton, that's the parts of Delaware that he grew up in, that's his community, that's the way he relates to his dad. And I, and I think we're going to see that be a big part of this campaign. And it's not, this is not going to upend the demographic move in this country over the last 50 years, but. It's on the margins, right? Can you pick up some voters who are disillusioned by Republicans or who maybe see Joe Biden differently because you communicated with them in this way? Like we said, you could 40,000 votes. doesn't take a lot to make sure that he wins re-election. So I think it's really important. And by the way, this is what most people in the country care about, right? Like you, you, you sit down in focus groups with people from any region, any state, any demographic group. They'll start talking about the cost of living. It's the first thing they'll talk about. It's the most important thing on most people's minds. Um, All right. So the most memorable part of the speech was the impromptu call and response that briefly turned the U.S. Congress into the House of Commons. It all started when Biden mentioned the Republican plan to hold the debt limit hostage. Let's take a listen. Instead of making the wealthy pay their fair share, some Republicans, some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. Let me give you, anybody who doubts it, contact my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. That means Congress doesn't vote. Well, I'm glad to see you. No, I tell you, I, I enjoy conversion. You know, it means if, if Congress doesn't keep the programs the way they are, they'd go away. Other Republicans say, I'm not saying it's a majority of you. I don't even think it's even a significant but it's being proposed by individuals. I'm not politely not naming them, but it's being proposed by some of you. So folks, as we all apparently agree, Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now, right? They're not to be stopped. I'm politely not naming folks. Call my office. I love well, it. Call my office. I love it. Uh, first of all, uh, do we need one of these for this? Red hen, civility alert, red hen. <laughs> Civility alert. Paging Chuck Todd. <laughs> Paging Chuck Todd. Tip O'Neill. Ronald Reagan. You're needed with a bourbon in the West Wing. Uh, Red Hen. It always, Red Hen. It always goes on a little Red longer Hen. than you want it to. <laughs> I mean, we. this joke is so old that the person at the center of it is now the governor of Arkansas to learn the state of the union response. <laughs> you know what? I like it. I, I think... Uh, people yelling at a State of the Union and then Joe Biden being able to slap it. This is great. It reminds me of, speaking of being old, remember when Obama went to like the House Republican retreat uh, to talk about, to like basically debate them about the health care bill back in what, 2009? And it turned out- 2010. 2010. It turned out really good. I think that like, yeah. I think people would benefit from more sort of back and forth with uh, politicians like this. I don't, I don't care about the civility. Yeah, it's, it was great. It was the most entertaining part of the whole thing. Wonderful. <laughs> and it's the thing that's good for Biden in this is it happened. These are the sort of moments that go viral. And this happened to Obama in 2010 as well, when Joe Wilson, a congressman from South Carolina, yelled, you lie, when he mm, talked yeah. about uh, the Affordable Care Act. And that sort of became a bit of a, that, that became a bit of a distraction. Um, this is a, you know, Republicans heckle Biden for Social Security Medicare, right? That's like a, if that's going to go viral, that's a pretty good thing to go viral. Yeah. I mean, most people who aren't uh, partisan Republicans seem to think Biden won that exchange. Why Why do you think he won? Because he had it with Marjorie Taylor Greene, George Santos, and Matt Gates. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, presidents almost always win those sort of engagements. They're on, they're, they, got, they had the big podium. They're with yeah, I was Congress, say the, which, the, the Yahoos in the crowd uh, didn't have a mic. Yeah, the peanut gallery <laughs> doesn't have a real have a w- historical winning record. You know? <laughs> it was great. I would offer one cautionary note on that exchange. Mm. I think 
I thought Biden was very quick on his feet in and making them basically agree not to get Social Security and Medicare. And I th- and then a lot of people became a thing in the immediate minutes after that. Be like, Dark Brandon tricked the Republicans into supporting Social Security and Medicare. And he, sort of, yes. But I don't think we should concede the fact, and I don't think the White House is, but I don't think we as Democrats should concede the fact that Republicans don't still want to cut Social Security and Medicare. Maybe they're not going to do it on the debt ceiling, which they probably never were. But the reason they lie about their 50-year desire to cut Social Security and Medicare is so they can get into power to cut Social Security and Medicare. And so we should continue yeah. to hammer them on that. Because they when we talk about Rick Scott's plan and the Freedom Caucus or the Republican Study Committee, those people want to do it. Mitch McConnell, one of his goals in life is cut Social Security. Every time Barack Obama ever had a conversation with Mitch McConnell about is there anything we could work on? Mitch McConnell would say, if you cut Social Security, maybe I'll do some stuff. Like that is why he exists. One of the Republican senators who has uh, wanted to gut Social Security and Medicare for a long time is Wisconsin's Ron Johnson. He was asked in an interview after the State of the Union, in an interview while he was talking about how angry he was that he has apparently been called out for um, telling the truth about what he wants to do. And this is what he said about Social Security in that interview after the speech. Yeah, so that's why what I've talked about, for the first time around in 2010, I just laid out the reality of Social Security. It's a legal Ponzi scheme. Yeah, yeah, this this program that I promise not to cut or get rid of is a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> I love keeping Ponzi schemes around. <laughs> it's just, that was great. That's great. These people, it's just... I mean, I think the other... I mean, the other reason that Joe Biden won this exchange is, like, it showed that he's sharp and quick on his feet, right? Like, look, he he is, he's 80 years old, <laughs> and he's not just old, but he's like an old school politician. He likes to tell long stories. He rambles. He fumbles words, not just because he has a stutter, but because he says a lot of words. <laughs> he likes words. Um, but the guy is sharp. Like, Republicans boo him for telling the truth about their position on Social Security and Medicare. And as he's getting booed on national television, he quickly realizes that the best move is to back them into a corner by ad-libbing, oh, I love I, I love conversions. I guess now Social Security is off the table. That's not an easy thing to do. And I do not think that that was a careful trap laid out, that they gamed the whole thing out. I think that he was quick on his feet and just decided to say that he loves conversions. And it was great. Yeah, well done, Joe Biden. I mean, I do think they probably... See if you think this. They they gamed out during speech prep that he was probably going to get um, some kind of booing, you lie, uh, shit from the Republicans in the House. And what will you do if that happens? I'm sure they gamed that out in speech prep. Oh, for sure. Because, I mean, Joe Biden is very transparently authentic. And it was very clear in how he set up that hit that he had some discomfort in what the response would be, in part because reportedly he sat in a room with Kevin McCarthy a few days ago when Kevin McCarthy said, we don't want to cut Social Security and Medicare. That's off the table. And so he was like, I'm not saying it's all of you, maybe not even a majority of you, just to be very clear. And I'm too nice a guy to name Rick Scott and Ron Johnson. <laughs> so it's like, like he yeah. knew where he, you know, you, you and I have been in this world where you've tried to get a politician to make a hit or to say something that they have some discomfort with for whatever reason. And he... He did it in a very Joe Biden way. And the thing about it was, is it was a, he didn't get mad. He didn't snap. He was a happy warrior. And that is always the best Joe Biden. And that's the prep talking because yeah. I'm sure like you get heckled like that. And we've seen it happen with our, our boss, with Obama. Never, not once. <laughs> <laughs> you get a, you can, you could snap. You really could yeah. snap. And it, because it's not easy, you know, when yeah. like you're getting heckled like that in the middle of a, a speech on national television. So Lawrence O'Donnell went even further and said that Biden didn't just win that exchange. He won the entire debt ceiling fight with that exchange. Uh, what did you think of that? Does he have a point or is that just the uh, MSNBC talking? <laughs> it's over. It's done. Put your money <laughs> back in the bank. <laughs> Buy the dip. Everything's great. No, I don't think I do not think that's the case. I. I don't think Social Security and Medicare were ever going to end up on the table in this battle. Even these incredibly stupid Republicans like Kevin McCarthy know that that is a losing proposition. This is what I've been thinking. And we have to be careful that now it's not like, well, Joe Biden won that, Social Security and Medicare off the table. So now we can finally engage in the conversation we've been wanting to have, which is how much do we cut from education and food safety? Right. Right. And that is the fear. And the principle has to be, 
We will negotiate on the budget after you take the fault off the table. That is the conversation. And we can't fall back into that. You see, Joe Manchin is already just going deep down into massive cuts to discretionary domestic spending to the things that affect people's lives and help people as a way to try to solve this self the self created crisis, how to put out the fire that we're, we're threatening to light. Yeah. And so that's the sense that no, we did not win it. It is not over. And we can actually make it a little bit worse if we overplay the hand we have right now. Yeah. He's busy uh, leafleting all the green rooms in DC with his op-ed. <laughs> Yes. Right to the center for right to the center for responsible budgeting. For look, him. look, he's just a guy who knows that the best way to communicate with the people of West Virginia is with an op-ed in the Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought one of the more moving and compelling parts of the night was when um, the president welcomed Tyree Nichols' parents and talked about police reform. Uh, let's listen. Most of us in here have never had to have the talk. The talk that brown and black parents have had to have with their children. Bo, Hunter, Ashley, my children, I never had to have a talk with them. I never had to tell them if a police officer pulls you over, turn your interior lights on right away. Don't reach for your license. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Imagine having to worry like that every single time your kid got in a car. Here's what Tyree's mother shared with me when I spoke to her. When I asked her how she finds the courage to carry on and speak out. The faith of God, she said her son was, quote, a beautiful soul and something good will come of this. Imagine how much courage and care that takes. Left unsaid there is, uh, you know, the fact that he was, I think, connecting to, uh, Tyree Nichols' parents as uh, another parent who has dealt with the loss of a child and just a lot of loss and tragedy in his life, just in a different way. So I thought that was, I thought the entire section on police reform was um, was quite moving and effective. Um, what other moments stood out to you? And was there anything you were surprised Biden didn't include or at least didn't say much about? I hate to get into the game of he did. He only spent 37 seconds on X, or he didn't do Y because. And we are very insular, insular, and biased on this point. But you've written the speech. I've run the policy process on the speech before. Fitting in everything, giving it's impossible to give anything, let alone everything. It's just do in the State of the Union. But I would say I was surprised he did not spend more time on abortion and the Republican assault on freedom that is happening around the country. And I think that that was a centerpiece of what he ran on the campaign. I imagine it will be a centerpiece of his next campaign. And they obviously, they obviously mentioned abortion. He talked about what he would veto if a ban ever came to him, but given the political environment, the continuing assault on reproductive freedom, on personal freedom that he did not talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. I had two thoughts on that. One I think he really wanted to focus the speech on um, things he could get done uh, in the next couple years. And I think he probably learned from the first term, from the first two years, that uh, you want to be careful what you, you want to be careful about over promising and setting expectations too high, as um, the uh, the bill formerly known as Build Back Better uh, taught us. And um, all he can really do aside from all the executive actions he's taking on abortion right now, is to promise to veto a national ban. Um, And so he sort of kept it at that. Uh, I also think that democracy and abortion were such big themes of the midterm elections, and the economy was not. And so talking about the economy really was sort of the like business left undone from the midterms. And so they really made a choice, which, again, is a hard choice to make, that the first basically 50 minutes of the speech, 5-0, were about the economy. And like the, if you were watching on TV, the second hour was everything else. And that's a lot of economy, but that's I'm sure they, they thought to themselves, we have not been talking about economic issues now enough. And we didn't get to much during the midterms because they were like scared off of inflation and they were talking so much about democracy and abortion. So I kind of think that's probably why they did it. Yeah, I I completely understand the strategic logic behind it because it's not even that they're not talking about the economy. It's that when they talk about the economy, no one covers it. Yeah, that's right. And so 
we Obama had the same thought, which is I've done all this. People don't know about it. Here's how what I've done has impacted people's lives or improved the economy. And this is my one chance to say it in front of tens of millions of people. With no filter, the, with no media filter. Yeah, because the next time I you I do a you know a visit to a factory in Michigan or a rose garden ceremony on the GDP numbers, ain't no one gonna hear it. So this is the one chance. That's how you get there. Which, you know, he went to Wisconsin the next day, didn't get a lot of coverage. <laughs> <laughs> Talked about the economy. Didn't get a lot of coverage. That's why he spent 50 minutes in the speech on it. Um, I was also surprised, by the way, that he got away with only talking about uh, the war in Ukraine. And he had like a couple lines on China. No other foreign policy. What an achievement. <laughs> Just not to piss off the world, though. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that was I was surprised. Usually all the the. Uh, the, the, the government, everyone in the government, from DOD to state to everyone else, they, they want like at least half the speech on foreign policy and they want you to cover all seven continents. You miss Antarctica, they're pissed. We missed a region once and boy, did we hear I it. Know. I guarantee you yeah. there are some people getting the phones burned up in the uh, Office of Public Engagement. We did not mention South America and we did not hear the end of it. <laughs> Yes. Rhodes had to fall on a sword for that one. I would say that I would imagine that various people in the Biden national security orbit are going to be on the phone with Ben Rhodes in his suspicion of next year's state of the union to figure out how you can wedge in 15 minutes on everyone's lowest, lowest political priorities. Uh, anyway, they'll cry about that on Pod Save the World next week. All right. Um, so during the speech, our friends at Navigator Research held a focus group in Las Vegas. It's my all-time favorite place for focus groups. Um with a diverse group of 29 Nevadans equally split between Democratic-leaning voters, Republican-leaning voters, and independents with no partisan lean. Pretty great reviews all around. 62% had a positive reaction to the speech. The percentage of people who believe the country's headed in the right direction moved from 17% to 55%. And there was a 21-point jump in people saying Biden is, quote, up to the job. Uh, pretty great. Anything else stand out to you in the uh, Navigator numbers? Dial groups usually work out very well for the person giving the State of the Union. Hmm. Absolutely. But the magnitude of the jumps here is interesting. And it is, I think, a bit of optimism for 2024 because the voters in this group are almost by definition people who pay less attention to political news on a daily basis. So they were hearing a lot of these things for the very first time. Like we we have, I guess, theoretically rolled our eyes at the bipartisan infrastructure bill. They're like, you passed a bipartisan infrastructure bill? That's cool. And so you see those jumps and we we all have a short attention spans. Everyone's going to forget this tomorrow, but come this fall or more likely next spring, Joe Biden's going to have an, a well, a extremely well-funded, always on paid media program telling people these things. And it shows you what the, you know, what the ceiling can be when people are informed on a regular basis and we're not relying on CNN and the New York times to tell them when you're just paying to tell them. And you can see those numbers on Biden's leadership on the economy moving pretty quickly once the paid campaign starts, if the economy continues to improve, as we've seen um, in recent months. So before we move on, uh, we should just talk briefly about Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders' uh, very forgettable response. Uh, here's a clip. We are under attack in a left wing culture war. We didn't start and never wanted to fight. Every day we are told we must partake in their rituals, salute their flags and worship their false idols. That's not normal. It's crazy. Whether Joe Biden believes this madness or is simply too weak to resist it, his administration has been completely hijacked by the radical left. The dividing line in America is no longer between right or left. The choice is between normal or crazy. I mean, she nailed it. <laughs> Just, the choice is between normal and crazy. I mean, look, that message worked for the Democrats in 2022. Why couldn't it work for the Republicans? <laughs> Does that uh, MAGA brainworm salad uh, tell us anything about the Republican Party and its uh, its message ahead of 2024? It is actually an object lesson in the dangers of building a hermetically sealed ideological media ecosystem yeah. because they are so their brains are so pickled from Fox and the online right-wing media that they have lost touch with reality. They turn on Fox and they think it's a window when it's really a mirror. And that is dangerous because that made you need a PhD in MAGA media to understand what the hell she was talking about. <laughs> and you end up in a situation where 
you are running against the right wing media caricature of Joe Biden, not the Joe Biden anyone sees. You know what? Look, there are credible arguments against Joe Biden that could very well win this election. The polling shows them. This is will inevitably be a close election. I'll tell you this right now. Joe Biden is a crazy radical leftist is not one of those arguments. It's just not. Yeah. It is absolutely not. Joe Biden, like forcing everyone to say Latinx. That's not going to be the uh, that's not what the election is going to hinge on. I don't think. Yeah, it is. There's just, <laughs> and there's it probably is. a lot of people being like, what? <laughs> what? What is she talking about? They are so far up their own asses. They cannot see straight. I had this conversation with Jane Coaston for offline many months ago, and she was talking about how Trump stump speech in 2016 had like a real message, even if you even if you didn't like the message. Trump's stump speech in 2020 was him talking about like the lovely Lisa Page and Peter Strzok and like all of these things that you had, like you said, you have to have a PhD in MAGA media to even understand. And he was just too online to really resonate with anyone beyond the people who are huge Fox News fans or Ben Shapiro fans or whatever. Um, and it just makes them say, and, and Tim Miller was telling me about this on, on offline. He's like, it's not just that they sound, Republicans sound extreme, is that they sound weird. Like they just sound like, and to normal American voters, don't pay much attention to politics, just show up and vote on election day. They're like, this woman is saying all kinds of weird shit. And Joe Biden's out there telling me that he's going to take on Ticketmaster. Eh, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, it's that they have started doing Fox News fan service. Yeah, it's they're playing all the hits for the people who are. It's like going to Comic Con for Marvel fans, right? Like that's who they're (laughs) speaking to. And you can't reach the rest of the country that way. Yeah. All right. Uh, When we come back, Democratic strategist Michael Pothorzer gives Dan the definitive take on what the 2022 midterm results tell us about 2024. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. The hospitality industry is heading for a hiring boom this spring. If you need to hire qualified candidates ASAP for hospitality positions or any other industry, you need ZipRecruiter. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful matching technology to find the most qualified candidates for a wide range of roles. ZipRecruiter makes it easy to send promising candidates a personal invite so they're more likely to apply. Let ZipRecruiter keep your team growing strong no matter what the industry. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-R-O-O-K-E-D. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Pod Save America is brought to you by Real Paper. Let's stop cutting down trees to make toilet paper. It's true. Humans are cutting down tens of thousands of trees every day. Just to wipe their butts. And the worst part is that when we use trees for toilet paper, it's just one and done. That's not the worst part. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're not, we're not saving it. Uh, it's obviously, obviously can't be recycled. Uh, so the, there's the obviously. Right. Or reused. Ugh. So it just goes straight into our water system. That's why... Oh, you guys throw it in the toilet? <laughs> Yes, most of the time. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, that's why we've made the switch to real paper. Real is 100% bamboo, so we're using a plant that grows fast, can be harvested and regenerated, like grass on a lawn, and doesn't impact entire ecosystems of forest. Real is the best kind of eco-friendly product because it doesn't feel like you're sacrificing something to help the earth. In fact, it feels like an upgrade. It's always shipped free to, uh, to your door in plastic-free packaging and You can schedule it on a subscription so that it comes exactly when you need it and you never have to worry about forgetting to buy it at the store. Reel is now partnered with One Tree Planted with every box of Reel that you buy. They are funding reforestation efforts across the country. So unlike the other TP that cuts down trees, Reel is putting them back up. Wow. It's putting them back up. Here's the thing. Tell us. I get real paper. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? I I, I use it Mm -hmm. in the way that you're supposed to use it. Mm-hmm. And then I feel good about myself because it nice. feels good and oh, it does. it's environmentally friendly. It is. Real Paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping and 100% recyclable plastic-free packaging. If you head to realpaper.com slash crooked and sign up for a subscription using our code crooked at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R dot com slash crooked or enter promo code crooked to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. Let's make a change for good this year and switch to real paper. Real is paper for the planet. Pod Save America is brought to you by Karayuma, the cool, sustainable sneaker brand working to reinvent the sneaker game in a way that's better for you and the planet. Springtime's just around the corner. 
Got about a month to go. As we transition out of the winter, we're welcomed with warmer days to get outside and spend our time doing what we love most. When it comes to days spent on your feet, Carrium has got you covered with unmatched comfort, premium quality, and peace of mind knowing they're made solely with sustainably sourced materials. Everyone needs a staple pair of sneakers to carry them through the season and beyond. And Akka's may just be the shoes your wardrobe has been waiting for. With over 33,000 five-star reviews, Akka has all the makings of a cult favorite. Classic canvas and a low-rise silhouette. Even your favorite celebrities love this versatile and crazy comfortable style. Akka is Karyuma's new school take on a timeless sneaker style. Take your pick of durable organic cotton canvas or ultra-soft responsibly sourced suede. Whether you're looking for an everyday neutral or a statement print, Karyuma has a pair for every personality. Even the ones that stink. And some of these fan favorite colors are finally back in stock after clearing a 77,000 person wait list, making it the perfect time to pick up a pair. They even have limited edition collaborations with brands like Avatar, The Peanuts, and Pantone, so make sure you check them out. I'd do a Snoopy sneaker. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. So, you know, remember when de Blasio killed that uh, groundhog? groundhog? Dropped it from a great height. Is that apocryphal? Did that really? No, what happened? Who's de Blasio? Um, He's a tall mayor. He ran for president. Mm. Like Cariumas? Yeah, I love my Cariumas. Look, they got a dedicated reforestation program. That's the second second ad we've read for. We are planting trees everywhere. Based in the Brazilian rainforest, their co-founders, David and Fernando, both grew up in Brazil, so this project is especially close to home. For every pair of sneakers sold, Cariuma plants two trees, and they've already planted over two million trees to date. Cariuma ships all their sneakers free and fast in the USA and offers worldwide shipping and 60-day free returns. They deliver right to your door using single-box recycled packaging. Now, for a limited time, Pod Save America listeners can get an exclusive 15% off your pair of Cariuma sneakers. Go to C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash cricket to get 15% off. That's C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash cricket for 15% off only for a limited time. Pod Save America is brought to you by Zbiotics. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Z-Biotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's that byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Hmm. What Zbiotics does is they produce an enzyme to break the byproduct down. It works like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. You just got to remember to drink this before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. We had a little bit of a crooked offsite, mm-hmm. and, and Thursday night was a dinner. Heading to the dinner, I got a text from my friend Tommy. He said, hey, I forgot my Zbiotics." I was full on panicking. Panicking. Well, and so I said, you know what? I got you. I, I got an extra. I, I really got an extra. appreciated that. And I drank it myself. And you know what? I felt great the next day. I felt I great. Just a couple drinks on a Thursday night. And I woke up Friday ready to go. That's the use case. The That's work th- dinner. Right. Nice. Every time I have a Zbiotics before drinking, it makes such a difference the next day. Give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash cricket to get 15% off your first order when you use code cricket at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. You won't be unsatisfied. Trust us. You won't be. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash cricket and use the code cricket at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. Joining us now is the former political director for the AFL-CIO. He's also a longtime Democratic strategist and one of the few people who accurately predicted there'd be no red wave in November. Michael Podorzer, welcome to Pod Save America. How are you doing? Great. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Very excited to talk to you on camera. We've had a lot of conversations uh, on the phone over the years, but your analysis in both in 2020, you went against the grain and you were one of the people warning a lot of Democrats privately that that election was going to be much closer than people thought and more close, and much more close than the polls showed. And then in 2022, not in the fall, not after Roe v. Wade was overturned, but in 2021, you were someone who said to a lot of Democrats, myself included, that Democrats had a real shot to upend the historical precedents in the 2022 midterm, that there would, Democrats could actually do well. Help us understand what it is you're seeing in American politics that's led you to both those conclusions. What happened, basically Donald Trump, right? <laughs> it, uh, and, and the reason this seems fairly obvious um, the way I tend to look at it, but not clear to many others, is that 
he really changed the electorate in a profound way in that the experience of being governed by MAGA, even for the first two years, brought out a new set of voters on both sides, but more against him than for him, that saw his being in charge, seeing people like Harry Lay, anybody who subscribes to that kind of um, agenda as being dangerous enough to be worth going out to vote. And the first demonstration of that was 2018, when turnout went up by 14 points and Democrats won by seven and a half, right? That was mostly people who had never voted in midterms before, but had, say, voted in 2016, were usually presidential voters saying, no, this is a national emergency. I still need to go out and vote. Right. And so the argument I was making in 2022 was that to the extent that those voters continue to see this as an as that serious a threat to their freedoms, to the country they want to live in, they're going to come out and vote again. And in 2022, um, thanks to the January 6 hearings and then Dobbs in the 15 or so states that were competitive and that had MAGA candidates at the top of the ticket, Democrats actually did better in most places than they did in the 2018 year, which is really like, try to get your head around that, right? Gretchen Whitmer, um, Tony Evert, Josh Shapiro, they won by more in a Republican year than they did in a Democratic plus seven year, because more and more people understand the danger that they're facing, right? And on the 2020, what was going on was that the people who were looking at it did not see the enthusiasm that sort of new Trump voters had in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, because they really were not on pollsters' radar. But we could see it on the ground in that they were registering to vote, you know, 30-somethings in sort of white rural areas were had decided that Trump was actually finally someone who was filling your pejorative enough to be worth joining the electoral process for. Right. And that just wasn't getting picked up on your sub stack. You have a very pretty granular analysis looking at the which I weekend reading, which I recommend everyone subscribe to uh, looks. You have a granular analysis. that looks the difference between states where MAGA was on the ballot and MAGA wasn't. There are some exceptions to that rule. Colorado, an example where uh, a not the non MAGA, the le- the lesser right. MAGA candidate uh, won the primary, but uh, the Democrats still did quite well. Texas, where I think you'd probably consider like Greg Abbott a MAGA right. candidate. No, no, the criteria was actually that it isn't exactly the perfect set of states, but it for the purposes of um, people understanding it more clearly. The key thing is whether or not the um, race was seen as competitive, whether because the key driver here is the media in the state about that raises the alarm for voters. Right. And so I used an objective um, measure, which was just whether it was considered very competitive by Cook Report. So that it didn't look like there was any cherry picking. Texas was not competitive. So even though it's obviously MAGA, that wasn't part of those states. So it was really for people who are that that familiar with it, it's basically the six to eight core presidential battlegrounds, plus a few others that had competitive races. There's, I guess, maybe two ways to look at the idea of MAGA being on the ballot. One is the candidates themselves, right? Whether the MAGA candidate was you know the nominee that's person Trump endorsed the yeah. person who pushing the big lie, and then there's just the overall threat of MAGA extremism overlying any Republican victory. How right. do you separate this? So, so would theoretically see a very different result if um, Mark Burnovich, the Attorney General in uh, Arizona, had been the nominee as opposed to Kerry Lake or Blake Masters, or maybe. David McCormick versus Dr. Oz or something like that. Would a in a world in, and it, and I say that in the context of what happened in Georgia, where a very MAGA candidate with the set of uh, problems that include not not limited to his his ideological extremism, and Herschel Walker was running. Warnock wins. Kemp 
Someone who we all would have considered to be a very extreme candidate prior to Donald Trump's opposition to said candidate winning with relative ease. How, how do you separate just the overall threat of MAGAs and the specific candidate? That's a really great, bringing Georgia in is really instructive, right? Because if you remember in 2016, when Trump upended everybody by winning Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, there was this whole idea that uh, Democrats are doomed. Those are lots of white non-college voters in those states. It's only going to get worse. And because our like the conventional analysis just like tries to pick the election, the electorate apart by demographics rather than sort of what actually is happening, right? You would have thought, and and, and it's really landed on almost everybody who talks about politics, but. Since that moment in 2016, when he won, at that point, in those five states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, fulcrum of American politics, there was one Democratic governor and four Democratic senators. Now there are four Democratic governors and nine Democratic senators. Democrats have like almost not lost any statewide race in those five states since it was supposedly the death of the Democratic Party that these states have become important because of their demographics, because the resistance to MAGA is really the driver there, right? Now you go to Georgia and Kemp, who was in a very close race with Stacey Abrams in 2018, and who was very much seen as the Trump candidate, right? Trump pulled him out and gave him the primary victory, right? He and Raffsenberger are the beneficiaries of Trump having tried to extort unsuccessfully those 11,870 votes because notwithstanding, you know, his politics, he is seen now not as scary as the rest of them, right? I mean, they were actually tested for t from most voters' perspective and they stuck with, from their perspective, rule of law, right? So the only place they're continuing to hang on is where they've actually demonstrated something. When you look at 2024, what is your level of concern? You have obviously Trump, who is the embodiment of MAGA. And then you have a bunch of candidates running on a MAGA who have built their political careers on a MAGA extreme agenda. But if it is someone other than Trump, that person is going to have t been opposed by Trump and defeated Trump. Does your, do you worry about a Kemp-like dynamic happening? Or is it very, you think that's very specific and isolated to Kemp's handling of the 2020 election? I think it's something that only he has personally. Because I think that, and here, right, luck can go wrong. But the the most predictable thing that will, um, I think, affect what we're talking about in twenty four is the Republican primary process, right? And right now we're thinking about it mostly as, you know, will someone take out Trump, right? But just remember twenty sixteen. Right. The forces that drive who's going to win are Fox and right wing media and the evangelical churches and all of the drivers in Republican primaries. And you're going to see whoever is in that recognizing their need to appeal to those voters and making themselves into what everybody hates. Right. And that's that's the most important thing. So that basically whatever, whoever comes out of that process, by definition, will be an extreme camp, which is essentially the process we saw in 2012. I mean, Mitt Romney right. emerged from that quite damaged by having to right. be, engage in a race to the bottom with Newt Gingrich and Michelle Bachman and Herman Cain and the rest of right. that parade. But then the really important thing is what happens on the Democratic side, right? Because if, if, um, it is, if there's a way in which it isn't clear um, it isn't generally accepted by the media that the whoever it is poses as great a threat. You have a real problem, right? That's that's the the fatal problem, and and we saw that in a sort of really like a sort of random controlled trial in 2022, right? In um, New York, California, and New Jersey, the Biden voters who stayed home and let the Republicans take the House, right, did not understand they were electing Kevin McCarthy, Speaker of the House, right? And there's 
And that's sort of a failure of the media. It's a failure of the uh, campaigns in those places that the that the thing that brought all those Biden voters out was hating MAGA. And those folks stayed home. Turnout was way down in those states. There was no sense of alarm over this. And that's the that's the danger in 24 is that the media will not treat this in the way they treated uh, 22 and 20. Right. Where it's I mean, that you can you can read that on the wall right now. It is it yeah. defines the Trump DeSantis right. coverage. You can see it in the never the anti-Trump Republican opinion leader, Republican Republican slash quote unquote conservative opinion yeah. leaders who think DeSantis is a viable alternative because he's essentially a less clumsy v- vessel for that right wing MAGAism, if you will, than Trump. And and you see how that how that can, how that is already playing itself out. So as you think about what Democrats need to do over the next you know year and a half here to prepare for that moment, what do you think are at the sort of the top of the punch list in terms of messaging or strategic objectives? Yeah, well, one thing I think that um, that really um, was so instrumental in 2022 uh, really should be understood is going to be repeating, which is June and the Supreme Court, right? The um, we saw what Dobbs could do, um, and it was so big that even though most of the folks you're talking about in the Democratic Party were really not ready for it, it still had that big impact, right? The Supreme Court this term and in June 2024 is going to be doing a lot of very unpopular things, and right, those are the things that convince Americans that. This isn't just partisan mudslinging. It's my freedoms are getting taken away. This is going to affect my life in a real way, right? So I think that's one thing really important is for folks to get, to understand what the important rulings that are going to be coming, how that's going to really take things away from people and and center that in the story of the next two years. President Biden in his State of the Union earlier this week seem if you sort of read beneath the sort of policy rollouts and accomplishments and, and framing the economy, but there seemed he seemed to make a very specific effort to make a very specific appeal to the very voters that you you pointed out Democrats were very afraid were going to cost us every subsequent election in the right. industrial Midwest. Is that a fool's errand to try to appeal, and I'm asking this of the former, you know, 25 yeah. year political director right. of the AFL CIO. Is that the right thing to be doing, or should the conversation be centered around Republican extremism, or is it a bit of both? One of the things that I know you've written about that a lot of people have written about because of the recent poll showing how little credit Biden gets for what are objectively enormous accomplishments and uh, policies that affect the voters that you're talking about. I think one of the things that's really not understood, especially if you're sort of coming to politics from, say, the 70s on, the 80s on, is the reason Democrats did so well with working class voters in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s had a lot to do with the fact that the only way rank and file working people believe that the government is helping them is when people they trust are telling them that the government's helping them, right? You can't come up with a message that says, I helped you, right? People are just too cynical of that, right? And it isn't part of their daily life. But back in that era, when Democrats could count on overwhelming support from working class voters, it wasn't just what they were doing. It's that if you were a working class voter, you were probably hearing how much your job depended on that from your shop steward or from your um, ward chair. I mean, there was an actual grassroots Democratic Party. And I think it's very difficult for any politician to get credit for policy right now because people don't believe politicians, right? So they should still do it. And it still gives people material to talk about. But the voters you're talking about reaching won't believe it coming from an ad or from a politician or something like that. I think the danger, less so in 23 than 24, 
is um, making bipartisanship seem credible, right, when it's not, because that reinforces people who are saying that those of us who think that this is a serious, serious threat are exaggerating or being alarmist. And right, either the Republican Party, as it's con constituted now, is a severe threat to the nation or it's not. And to sort of toggle back and forth between saying they're the greatest threat to democracy since the Civil War and we can get along and do things is undermining. Interesting. Okay, last question for you. In yeah. I remember you and I had a conversation. It was basically, I think, the week before the pandemic hit, and it was about your deep concerns about how the Republicans would try to overthrow the election by abusing the their control over the electoral process, the electoral flaw, loopholes, the Electoral right. Counts Act, what all, and then you spent the next many months of your life preparing and helping organize efforts to try to protect the election, the electoral, the integrity of that election. Since then, uh, we have reformed the Electoral Counts out in some way. Democrats have held on to critical governorships in battleground states. We've won secret, you know, we averted worst case scenarios with, you know, members of the Oath Keepers being in charge of the electoral process and all of that. What is your fear about Republicans being able to overturn a electoral college victory for President Biden in 2024? Is there are you less concerned about it or is there a specific thing that is still, you know, the uh, is there still specific loopholes you think they're going to come after that Democrats should be aware of and try to tighten up if we can? Not surprising. It's something I'm already really thinking through the 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 threat of a failed election changes very differently from 2020 to 2024. Right. Because there the problem was going to be how do you get the person who basically has the tanks out of the White House, right? And who has all sorts of um, untested extraordinary powers and all those other things, right? Here, like Democrats are running the election, right? So the, the most important thing is actually winning the election, right? And uh, <laughs> which some people sometimes forget as they get sort of caught up in the, um, the, the crisis but that's the main thing like got to win i think the 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 greatest threat to the 2024 election is the supreme court and what it could do either in its independent state legislature ruling or in other decisions it has to make um between now and the election either big ones like that or if it's going to be a close election um in uh uh, in how, in in a Bush v. Gore kind of way, in uh, 2024, in that sort of week before, week after the election, where who knows what happens. And I think a lot of people have become complacent about the Supreme Court because of the way it just didn't do anything to help Trump in 2020. And I think the... the um, excuse me, two big reasons why the Supreme Court did not get involved in 2020. One was that the business community had decided before um, the election that, uh, that they were pretty much done with Trump. And so once it was clear that everybody accepted that Biden had won, they wanted stability. They didn't want, you know, everything disrupted. And that also because of the electoral college system, once Biden picked up Arizona and Georgia, he had to overturn three elections, not one. And that's really difficult, right? I mean, to figure out a way to do that. So I think they just stayed away. But if it's if it's too close, Supreme Court has a, a very dangerous role to play there. The other sort of potential situation that, again, creates a crisis for the Supreme Court is if Republicans uh, take the Senate and the House, keep the House, right? Because then the January 4th of 2025, they're the ones doing the whole thing. So the, the threat continues, as you would say. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, follow Michael on Twitter, subscribe to his Substack. You will learn a ton about politics, as I always do. All right. Thanks, Dan. Pod Save America is brought to you by Autonone. 
Invest in clothing that will help save the planet with Outer Known. Outer Known offers comfortable men's and women's clothing. They're the first brand founded on a total commitment to sustainability. Products are made from organic or recycled materials that feel amazing and never go out of style. Outer Known only works with factories that pay fair living wages and provide safe working conditions. Sustainability is at the heart of everything Outer Known does. It's the driving force behind the brand. Every Outer Known product is comfortable, breathable, fits great. It's designed to make you look and feel great. It's sustainably made for a better planet. Tommy, tell us about some of the clothes you've received. I love my two, well, I purchased two Outer Known sweaters. I received a blanket shirt. I noticed at our company offsite last week that GC was rocking the blanket shirt. And I said, GC, hmm. wow, that's a good looking shirt on a good looking guy. And he said, I know. Yeah. So I don't know. What an exchange. Then, right to HR, he went. Right to <laughs> Sophia, he <laughs> went. inappropriate. <laughs> Write that one down. Uh, they got some denim, some jeans too, if anyone wants some some jeans. They got all kinds of stuff. I'm looking sweaters. at the website now. Yeah. Great shirts, great bathing suits, trunks, if you will. Trunks? Wow. Not, not, a, I don't not know. a trunk. Trunk. Trunks. Go to outerknown.com slash PSA25 today and you'll get 25% off your first order. That's outerknown.com slash PSA25 spelled O-U-T-E-R. K-N-O-W-N dot com slash PSA 25 to receive the 25% off discount code. Check them out today, outerknown.com slash PSA 25. And don't forget to use the promo code on the page for 25% off. Pod Save America is brought to you by Fume. Be smart, don't start. Kick the habit. Put it out before it puts you out. All phrases we've heard a hundred times. hundred times. Do we here know right what now. they mean in this context? Who knows? Yet we still continue to have bad habits. You know, I have plenty of bad habits. I bite my nails. You do bite your nails. Yeah. It's gross. Yeah. I don't wish. I don't want to do it. Uh, love it. What do you do? Um, sometimes I just crash my car into other people just to feel something. Okay. Huh. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> wow. I would say that's a bad habit. I do some therapy. Well, on maybe that. Fume can help. Our sponsor Fume is on a mission to accelerate humanity's breakup from the bad habits that consume far too many of us. Fume is a natural diffusive device that uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. Fume is not a vape. It's a non-electronic device designed to transform your negative habits. Instead of pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals, like a vape. Like our opinions. Fume uses cores infused with plants like peppermint and cinnamon for delicious natural flavors. Fume's new, quote, version two model is snappy and tactile. With an adjustable airflow dial and a magnetic end cap, your fingers will always have something to do. That's important for your your finger should always have something to do. It looks yeah. very cool. Idle These hands, etc. Idle yeah. hands. Devil's play. So they play to playground. Talk playground. about the look, feel, and test. Look, it it looks great. It feels great. There nice you go. Minty boy, sensation. does it taste great. Look, I didn't expect much out of fume when I got it, but the minty sensation. Oh, talk about it. It's pretty powerful. Powerful minty sensation. And let me tell you. Let tell me tell you where it hits. Where does it hit? Right in the back of the throat. <laughs> The easiest way to stop a bad habit is to switch to a positive one, and Fume's designed perfectly to do just that. It's Fume's goal to make switching easy and even enjoyable. They got thousands of five-star reviews from people just like you who've successfully switched when other solutions just didn't work. Head to tryfume.com and use code PSA to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. The Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors and the new version 2 Fume to help kickstart your positive habits. That's tryfum.com and use code PSA to save an additional 10% off on your order today. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed or like you're not showing up the way you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you. Talk about how you feel when you felt out of control in life. I mean, I'm a control freak, so I often feel so out of control. So I find myself on this balloon and somehow we're <laughs> over Montana. <laughs> I just can't, uh, con- I can't get uh, the thing uh, to uh, go where I want it to go. I get you. Uh, I get you. I, get uh, I just wanted there. to call someone and talk uh, it through. Ah. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp's a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. We love therapy. We are the Therapy Boys. We are the Therapy Boys. You are listening to the Therapy Boys. Welcome to this week's episode of the Therapy Boys. It's the Therapy Boys. (laughs) Our famous catchphrase, how you feeling? (laughs) Tell me more about that. Uh, if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash PSA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash PSA. Okay, before we go, the new Republican House spent the week counter-programming Joe Biden's State of the Union with a congressional hearing focused 
on the financial struggles of middle-class Americans. Just kidding. It was about Hunter Biden's laptop. Uh, Specifically, it was about the decisions that Twitter made regarding the initial New York Post story about the laptop over two years ago. Republicans hauled former Twitter executives before Congress to testify and used the hearings as an opportunity to air personal grievances about their own experiences on the social media platform, which, you know, who among us? Um, I'd say it didn't go as planned, but that would be assuming that they ever had a plan. Uh, We're going to talk about a few highlights uh, so you can translate your uncle's crazy Facebook posts about this topic. Um, Let's play the first clip where you'll hear from uh, three of the greatest legal minds of our time, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Jim Jordan, and Clay Higgins. 52 United States Law 10101. No person shall intimidate, threaten, coerce, or attempt to stop any other person for the purpose of interfering with their rights to vote or to vote as he may choose. You didn't shadow ban or permanently ban my Democrat opponent. No, you did that to me. And that was wrong, and it was against the law. Is this a violation of the First Amendment when the government, Mr. Chan, again, sending you an email saying, we think these accounts need to be looked at because they violate your terms of service? That's a different standard. So you got the government saying your terms of service, which don't have to comply with the First Amendment, but the government saying we don't think these accounts comply with your terms of service. Please take them down. You, ladies and gentlemen, interfered with the United States of America 2020 presidential election, knowingly and willingly. That's the bad news. It's going to get worse because this is the investigation part. Later comes the arrest part. Your attorneys are familiar with that. What? <laughs> First of all, I've seen Clay Higgins' name a couple times. Never seen him in person or heard him speak. He sounds like uh, he's a sounds like a real winner. I've never heard Clay Higgins' name. I don't know who that is. It's possible Missouri. You made that Missouri name as up. a representative from Missouri. Yeah, real sure. Real Looney Tune. Just going out there arresting people. Uh, any uh, any reactions to that? To all that legal legal all those legal takes. <sighs> Uh, seems incorrect on a number of ways. <laughs> I like that um, uh, Large Marge just slipped in there. Uh, it's not just wrong. She's like, and that is wrong, and it is illegal. Did she just make a Goonies reference? Uh, no, that's a Pee Wee's uh, Big Adventure. Oh, Pee Wee is Pee Wee's Big. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Get your get your '80s re- '80s movie references right, Dan. Well, that, I'm in, I am honestly embarrassed by that, and no one producing this podcast has any idea what we're talking about. <laughs> Andy laughed. Andy, Andy's with us. Uh, my <laughs> fellow denizen from Gen X. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that that was not correct. None of that legal advice, none of those legal takes were correct. Just <laughs> one small point to make on this. This has nothing, zero zilch to do with the First Amendment. You have no First Amendment right to be on Twitter. This is a fact. It's a private company. Full stop. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you uh, heard at the uh, beginning of this podcast about uh, Chrissy Teigen's tweet. <laughs> I, and um, I want to apologize to the parents that we did that. <laughs> have, any, have any against my wishes, I will say. In this second clip, um, we'll hear about how there was a, a conspiracy at the highest levels of our government to silence an American citizen for sharing political views that the D.C. establishment didn't want you to hear. Let's listen. And according to notes from a conversation with you, Ms. Navarroli's counsel, your counsel, the White House almost immediately thereafter contacted Twitter to demand the tweet be taken down. Is that accurate? Thank you for the question. In my role, I was not responsible for receiving any sort of request from the government. However, What I was privy to was my supervisors letting us know that we had received something along those lines or something of a request. In that particular instance, I do remember hearing that we had received a request from the White House to make sure that we evaluated this tweet and that they wanted it to come down because it was a derogatory statement Uh, uh, directed uh, towards the president. They wanted it to come down. They made that request. To my recollection, yes. I thought that was an inappropriate action by a government official, let alone the White House. But it wasn't Joe Biden about his son's laptop. It was Donald Trump because he didn't like what Chrissy Teigen had to say about him. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. My, my, my. 
uh, Democratic Representative Jerry Conley from Virginia, obviously a big Chrissy Teigen fan. <laughs> yeah, he's so, like, I thought he was about <laughs> nailing that, the delivery. It was like a fucking episode of Matlock, the way he was doing it, and then he fumbled the name at the end. <laughs> Amazing. The Trump White House reached out to Twitter to ask them to take down Chrissy Teigen's tweet because they were upset that it was derogatory towards Donald Trump. Just that that didn't make it in Matt Taibbi's uh, Twitter file thread or Barry Weiss's thread. What what do you think's going on there? Oversight. Now we have fucking brainworms. No one knows yeah. what we're talking about. <laughs> right. No one knows what we're talking about. Ridiculous. Are you guys deep in the hole of a very esoteric, small and still dying social media platform? Then stay here. <laughs> well, you know what? The the United States Congress held an entire hearing on it this week. Unbelievable. All right. In this next one, we're going to finally learn the answer to the question on everyone's mind. Why can't I find all of Lauren Boebert's best tweets? So I'll ask again. Did you shadow ban my account? Yes or no? Again, not to the best of my recollection. So the answer is, Mr. Roth, yes, you did. I found out last night from Twitter staff that you suppressed my account. Being the sinister overlords that you all are, you placed a 90-day account filter so I could not be found. And now we see here that Twitter staff said the visibility filter on my account excluded me from top searches, prevented notifications for non-followers, and much more. This is is considered an aggressive visibility filter. You silenced members of Congress from communicating with their constituents. <laughs> Can I just say, oh, the filter prevented, it prevented notifications from non-followers? Like, I hope so. I don't follow fucking Lauren Boebert for a reason. I don't want to know what the hell she's saying. <sighs> if only there were some other way for a member of Congress to be heard. Could you know if could they go to the floor of the house and speak where the TV cameras are on twenty four seven? Yeah. What, are there what? other social media platforms she might possibly use to get her word out? Is there an entire right wing propaganda network for which she could speak to people? <laughs> she was complaining because she had some fire tweet making fun of Hillary Clinton that no one could that, that the world couldn't get. It's maybe your tweet just wasn't that good. Yeah, shitty tweets. All right, finally, the panel obtains a damning admission of bias from a former Twitter executive that the company's leaders changed the platform's policy in order to accommodate the leader of one political party. Let's listen. Uh, Donald Trump publicly uh, incited you know, violence at a rally uh, targeting four congresswomen, including myself, saying, go back to where you came from. Uh, Ms. Navarroli, as I understand it, you were uh, the most senior member of Twitter's content moderation team, or a senior member of Twitter's content moderation team when this was posted. Um, as part of your responsibilities, did you review this tweet? My team, Ray, made the recommendation that for the first time we find Donald Trump in violation of Twitter's policies and use the public interest interstitial. And at the time, Twitter's policy included a specific example when it came to banned abuse uh, against immigrants as in they specifically included the phrase, go back to your country or go, or go back to where you came from, correct? Yes, that was specifically included in the content moderation guidance as and an you, example. You brought this up to the vice president of trust and safety, Del Harvey, and she overrode your assessment. And something interesting happened after she overrode your assessment. A day or two later, Twitter seemed to have changed their policies, didn't they? Yes, that trope, go back to where you came from, was removed from the content moderation guidance as an example. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. I mean, believable, but uh, so that that was AOC proving that uh, Twitter was not changing their policies to um, please the libs, but to please Donald Trump. It's kind of a piece of evidence that we have lost the thread on the threats of social media in this country and that we are playing this stupid game of whack-a-mole where we're trying to deal with specific pieces of content that should be suppressed or not suppressed or disinformation when ultimately we have left ourselves in the hands of a bunch of tech billionaires are going to do what's in the best interest of their country, of their company, whether that is let Donald Trump do what he's doing, stop Donald Trump what he's doing. Jack Dorsey said they did one thing, Elon Musk comes another. And it's just the issue, if we want to truly deal with this problem of social media, it's going to have to be regulation. It's not going to be through the policies of these companies because they cannot be trusted to do things right, wrong, left, right, anyway. It is going to be what's in their interest. Or we just wait for Elon to completely break the platform and then we don't have to deal with it anymore. Yeah. It's also so funny that we are so worried about this one small platform that barely communicates with anyone. And just 
you know, it's the it is the equivalent of the Chinese balloon thing, which is, oh my God, there's a balloon. It's like, oh, what about the 70 million people walking around with the app from the Chinese government on their phone? <laughs> like, same thing. Like maybe we should we should worry about that or Facebook, which reaches exponentially more people than Twitter. But we are very focused on Twitter because we are we are in the political media bubble. That's true. Who cares? Who cares? Well, you're all in it with us. Um, <laughs> thanks to Michael Podhorzer for joining us today. And everyone have a great weekend. You know, get offline. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.